are so divine. We thank you that you are God and we are not. We can fear not because of that. We don't have to fear the past. We don't have to fear the present. And we don't have to fear what lies ahead or with what's to come. When we have such a comforting promise, Lord, and in your scripture, whenever people are suffering persecution or are afraid, you always remind them of what is to come, and that is paradise with you forever and ever. So we know that when we close our eyes, when we open them again, that we will be in paradise with you forever and ever. So what do we have to fear? We can fear no more because you forever reign. We thank you for that, and we thank you for your word that we'll be studying tonight. Encourage us through it, instruct us by it, Convict us and move in us, Lord, drawing us closer and closer to you and your will. We thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Everybody got a copy in front of them? We're on Psalm 19 and 20 tonight, talking about the law of the Lord, which is perfect. Again, this is a psalm of David, so let's just jump right into Psalm 19. The heavens declare the glory of God. And the sky above proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours out speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words whose voice is not heard. Their voice goes out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In them he has set a tent for the sun, which comes out like a bridegroom leaving his chamber, and like a strong man runs its course with joy. Its rising is from the end of the heavens and its circuit to the end of them, and there is nothing hidden from its heat. That brings us to question one, where we're asked to read verse one again. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. How do the heavens declare the glory of God? How? Beauty. Beauty, okay. Okay. And why? Why does that? How, how does the beauty of God's creation declare the glory of God? How does the skies proclaim his handiwork? He made it. So it's, a, it's something that's been created, it's some, so therefore there must be a creator. You didn't make it. If you were walking along one day and you saw a robotic arm laying on the ground, you'd look at that and say, wow, that just popped into existence. Or you'd say, wow, this technical, fancified, obviously designed and created item must have had a creator. So if you have no problem picking up a robotic arm, which only has, let's say, a thousand pieces in it, and you say, look, this obviously has a creator, but you can't look at all of creation, which is far more complex in, a, in an immeasurable way, and, and not come to that same conclusion that there must be a creator. And if there is creation, and there is a creator, then the creation points to him, right? You look at a piece of artwork, you say, what a, what a talented artist. You look at all creation, you say, what a creator. This is something, yeah, go ahead, Bob. Just a quick sentence. When we left the apartment tonight, Jill said, look up at the sky, look at that beautiful, Oh, it was pink, it's red. red. Yeah. Yeah. Dark like that. clouds. Yeah. That just doesn't happen. Yeah, another way of looking at this is that creation reveals a creator. Yeah. So it's a revelation of there being a God, a creator who made all this. You know, my mom and dad could be credited with making me, but they didn't really make me. God made me. And so all these things are revelations of a creator. And therefore, giving that creator glory or pointing to him. This is uh, something that is, can be seen by everybody. It's a general kind of revelation. Everybody can see it. There, there's no one that misses that. Everybody can see or knows about creation. There is uh, a portion of scripture that might be tickling your brains regarding giving God glory as creator. And it's found in Romans 1. Romans 1, verses 18 through 21. This is a little side note for you. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them. It's plain to everybody. Because God has shown it to them. 
His invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. Creation. It's exactly what we're talking about in Psalm 19. So they are without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. Yeah, Steve. Does Luke 1940 also go ahead? You're going to have to read that. I don't have the Bible memorized. Well, I tell you that if these should keep silent, when he's talking about the disciples and they're trying, the Pharisees are trying to silence their praise. Mm -hmm. If these should keep silent, the stones would immediately cry out. Yeah, I mean, saying that creation will cry out if man does not do. Yeah, there's two different types of creations speaking. There's the the audible, and then there's the inaudible, right? So the inaudible is the general revelation of creation, which would be like what we're talking about in Psalm 19. But if what Jesus is trying to point out there is that look, if you withhold the proper praise or the proper reaction to what's going on here, the very rocks themselves will cry out. So he's he is referencing this type of creation glorifying God moment that we see here in Psalm 19 and that Paul's referencing in Romans 1, but he's not saying that they're literally going to cry out. He's referencing that, though, and it's a powerful reference to show that, look, if you don't worship the Creator, his, if you as a, as a creation won't worship your Creator, the rest of creation will. This is his point that he's making. Plus, that scripture, you know, I can't remember, I used to know the one about there's no excuse, there'll be no excuse for people not to believe because of... Yeah, that's what we just read, Romans 1. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> just again, I'll read it right I'll, I'll read it again. I'll read it again. Translation. For, this is verse Romans 1, verse 19 through 21. For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power, his divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world. In the things that have been made, comma, so they are without excuse. There's your spot. I missed that. For although they knew God, they know God. They, they, deep down, everybody knows they didn't just pop out of existence, that they're not just goo. But in rebellion, they turn their backs on God. And some people plug their ears and say, la, 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 I just don't believe, la, la, la. Other people just say, well, I'm going to come up with a theory that allows me to believe there's not a God. Other people just make their own gods up. He says, for although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him. But because, and because of that, they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. So this... This is an, another good spot here to describe something else, which is you have creation that everybody sees. Everybody sees the glory of God in creation, but not everybody is saved, even though everybody sees the glory of God and the evidence of there being a creator all around them. When we're out hiking in the woods or, or fishing in a stream and stuff, you see all these things that are far greater than you, that have been along, around longer than you, and will be around after you're gone, you have no idea how to make a river. You have no idea how to make a fish out of thin air. Only God can do these things. But yet, even though all this revelation is around us about there being God, there is no salvation for everyone, even though everyone sees it. So that tells you that there must be some form of a, a special kind of revelation, that you have one that is for everybody, like a general revelation of God and as creator, as stated in Romans 1, so that none are with excuse. But there's also that special kind of revelation where God opens it up, where he calls you and he draws you to himself, opens your eyes, opens your, opens your ears, so you're able to then see and perceive in another way more deeply than what the general person does. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So that's the other thing that we learned from this, is that there's obviously, you know, from Psalm 19, that the heavens declare God's praises. That ties into Romans 1 where Paul's talking about the sinfulness of mankind in not giving God praise as creator. Even though all these magnificent things are all around you, you still, humankind still does not give God worship and praise unless God specially intervenes in the heart of that person, causing regeneration and then faith. All right, question two. What about verses two and three? What do they mean, and how does it fit into our answer to question one? Verses two and three says, Day to day pours out speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words, whose voice is not heard. What in the world does that mean? 
Is that a contradiction? It's not a contradiction. It's just another way of saying something that we've kind of already said. There's speech, but there's not speech. Creation is telling a story, but it's not going, hello, hello, uh, Timmy, Timmy, I need to tell you a story about the creation and about how God is the creator. It's not literally speaking with verbal words that you can hear, but creation is communicating. It is speaking to us of the glory of God. When Jill stepped out and saw that beautiful handiwork of God, she made mention of it, right? It's the same idea here, that creation is glorifying God in the way that it can. And so that happens day to day. It's constantly, day to day, it's constantly pouring out that kind of speech, glorifying God. And night to night, doing the same thing, revealing knowledge of God, that there is a creator. There is no speech, nor are there words whose voice is not heard. In other words, they, they tell of God. All of creation tells of God. You might not literally hear them, but you hear them. Right? If I can tell you a story without using verbal words, right? You can learn stories just from watching and looking at pictures, can't you? You can read a whole story that way. They're called movies. And so you can have a silent movie and say, hey, I understand exactly what's being said here. It's the same with nature. Even though nature is audibly silent, it is telling a story of God's supremacy, his role as creator, and glorifying him as such. Any thoughts on that? Now, see how that goes together with what we were talking about in verse 1? Kind of helps to just bookend that nicely. What about question 3? What do verses 4 through 6 mean? It says, their voice goes out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. Uh, let's just stop there. What, is, what does that mean? That their words go out? Whose voice are we talking about? The voice of creation. So the voice of God's creation goes out to all the earth. Well, it makes sense because all the earth is his creation. And their words to the end of the world. So that means that only part of the earth is going to hear or see this or all of it. All of it. All of it, yeah. Which again ties to Romans 1 that none are with excuse. Because all of God's creation goes out to all the earth and shares and tells of God's magnificent glory as creator. You can maybe even draw the conclusion that Paul had this psalm in mind when he was writing Romans 1. Because it certainly has a lot of ties to it. A lot of ties to it. Uh, continuing on, verses 4 through 6. Their voice goes out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In them he has set a tent for the sun, which comes out like a bridegroom, leaving his chamber. And like a strong man, runs its course with joy. Its rising is from the end of the heavens, and its circuit to the end of them. And there is nothing hidden from its heat. Any thoughts on what that could be? This is more descriptive than it is anything. Sometimes, remember, you know, as we read through the Old Testament, especially when we were in Isaiah, you saw many times where there was just analogies given, something to give you an idea of power. Or when we're in Revelation, somebody says, oh, he's like a lion. Right? So you think of lions, what do you think of? You think of strong, you think of perhaps vicious or dangerous, right? You think of horses, you think fast, you think lightning, you think power, right? You know, so all these things are analogies. And so here you have just another set of analogies talking about power, talking about glory, right? When you think of the, the brilliance of the sun, and if you think the sun is brilliant, well, just think of the one who created it. You think, you think that the sun is powerful, or you think the waves crashing against the beach are powerful. What about the one who created it? What about the one who holds all that up with just a word? How powerful is he? How radiant and brilliant is he? And so you have a tent for the sun. Uh, this ties back into the way Eastern philosophers used to think, that we had a dome around the earth. And so this is kind of talking to that or using it as an analogy. So something familiar to the people of this time and this time when it was written, being used as an analogy to describe joy, power, brilliance, radiance. That's what's happening here. Oh, that there's a, that there's a power behind all these powers. Any thoughts or questions on that?
And there's, there's a circuit. The sun runs a circuit. There's, it comes up. It goes down. Everything that you're familiar with has a creator behind it who the creation glorifies. And if God knows how to make sure that creation does what it's supposed to do, certainly he'll make sure that everything else does, right? You don't have to worry about politics. You don't have to worry about what's happening in the world around you. Because the same God who makes sure that the planets are in the exact axis that they need to be, with the exact gravitational pull, the moon's exactly where it needs to be, the sun's exactly where it needs to be, all the all this constellations, everything exactly where it needs to be, no molecule out of place, that same God is the God who's in charge of your life. So, you're not. Because the heavens have never fallen. The sky has never fallen, chicken little. Like, that's never happened. God never has failed. Not once. And when finally he does roll up the sky like a scroll, it's because he does it himself. So he's always in control of everything. He is worthy of praise. All right, verse 7. The law of the Lord is perfect. Well, this is another thing that's very comforting to us. God's power is creator but also the fact that his law is perfect. Reviving the soul. Is your soul less than full? Does it need reviving? You would go to the law of the Lord. It is perfect. It revives the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey and the drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is your servant warned, and keeping them there is great reward. Who can discern his errors? Declare me innocent from hidden faults. Keep back your servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless and innocent of great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. That's one of the best sections of scripture there. Question four. Verse seven mentions the law of the Lord. What is the law of the Lord? What's it mean? What's it mean? Law? Is, there, is there a better way of translating it than saying the law of the Lord? Is there other words that you can use that would perhaps make more sense to our minds today? God. What's that? God's word. God's word, yes. What's another way of saying God's word? If, uh, if uh, I had to use either adjectives or I had to use other descriptors to describe God's word, it's God's, um, I need to know how to do something. So I go to God's word for guidance. guidance, yep, direction, wisdom, wisdom, instruction, absolutely. So you could say that the law of the Lord could be translated the teaching of the Lord, or the direction of the Lord, or the wisdom of the Lord, or God's instructions. <laughs> Yes. yes, there is. I was thinking it. I already caught the one, but the words of my mouth. <laughs> it's also interesting. So it says, the law of the Lord is perfect. So God's teaching is perfect. It revives the soul. The, the testimony, testimony means to, to, to give witness. So to give witness, you can read it this way. The teaching of the Lord is perfect. It revives the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure. So his his witness is sure. So whatever he speaks to is also sure. So the teaching of the Lord is perfect. It revives the soul. The testimony or the witness that it speaks to is sure. And it makes wise the simple. I like that. I like when I can sound wise when I'm really just simple. That's one of the benefits of just doing expository preaching is that God's word is so wise that it makes a simple-minded fool like myself look wiser than I really am. I'm just a simple boy. These are God's law, 
His law could be translated precept or order. So these, are, these aren't just God's suggestions. These aren't just God's like rules if you kind of feel like it. These are God's orders. These are God's teachings. These are God's commands. All these things are important notes. We'll keep that in mind as we go to question five. According to verses seven and eight, give us eight descriptions of the law of the Lord. So let's, uh, let's go through. I'll keep count on my hands. I don't have an abacus here. So we have uh, in order, the law of the Lord, or the teaching of the Lord is what? Perfect. Perfect. There's one. There's one descriptor. What about the, uh, what's it do to the soul? Revives, it. Revives the soul. What about God has, God's word, God's teaching testifies about himself. And his testimony is? Sure. Perfect, sure, accurate, truthful. You can be confident in it. Like those old people are confident, confident, dry and secure. Raise your hand, raise your hand if you're sure. Have you ever seen them? And they had the Statue of Liberty holding a sure bar of deodorant. You know, because she's confident that there's no sweat marks when she holds up the. <laughs> We're going way back on that commercial. <laughs> yeah, you didn't really miss anything, Bob. Trust me. Trust me. Trust me. So his testimony is sure. What's, what does God's word do for the simple? Makes them wise. Verse 8 starts out by saying that the precepts or the orders of the Lord are what? Left? Right. 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 Correct. Accurate. They're right. That's five. God's word causes the heart to what? Rejoice. Rejoice. You have, you and I have, the word of God at our disposal. It will make you wise. You can trust it, just like you can trust God. And so we rejoice in that because God's command, his precepts, his witness about himself, his truth, all there for us, all protected by him, given to us by him. So it makes our heart rejoice. What about um, the commandment of the Lord is? Four letter words start with P and end in any word. Pure. Pure. God's word is pure, untarnished. And it does something to our eyes, the last one, number eight. What's it do to our eyes? It enlightens, it enlightens your eyes. Which is another way of saying what? That it, it enlightens not just your eyes, but your everything about you, right? You, your heart, your mind, your soul. It enlightens your eyes, and because it goes through your eyes, it enlightens your eyes. It's like, whoa, right? Oh, my eyes have been enlightened. Right? You think, I think I might like black licorice, and then you try it, and your eyes are enlightened, and you say, this is trash. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. <laughs> I, bet right. you, I bet you most would agree with me, yes. There's a few weirdos out there who like black licorice. Black licorice. Why? I don't want angry emails. Okay. I just mean It's the only kind of jelly beans I like is black ones. Really? Uh, uh, I don't like that. I'll remember that. I'll remember that. I'll keep a separate drawer. And every time I find one, I'll... Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Question six, what about verse nine? What does it mean? Verse nine says, the fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. What does that mean? The fear of the Lord is clean. It endures forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. Any thoughts on that? Now, we want to keep it in context to what we're talking about here. Because I know we can go beyond this and we can say, okay, um, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, right? Or the beginning of wisdom. And so to know God is holy and to know that we are not is the beginning of wisdom. Because then we say, God's holy, I'm not, I'm in trouble. What do I do? And then that leads you to Christ. And his sacrificial atonement for our sins and our God, by God's grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone, we can be saved from our sins. But here, it's saying the fear of the Lord is clean. What, 
what's that make you think of? The fear of the Lord is clean. It's not dirty. It's clean. Pure. Pure. Good. Right? Clean's good. Clean's pure. We just read that description earlier, right? Makes the heart rejoice. It's pure. It enlightens the eyes. So the fear of the Lord is good. It's clean. It endures forever. It, it, there has no end to it. God, God's not going to rewrite his word. It endures forever. The rules of the Lord, then, are true and righteous altogether. And, and that's really the hint to the context there, because fear here is referring, referring to God's precepts, his, his commandments, his orders, because it says the rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. So if I say God's rules are righteous and true altogether, they endure forever and they are clean. It makes you say they're good, they're right. And I don't want to, I, I, I should fear if I go against what's good and right and pure and true. It's all the same. It's just worded weird for the way that we read things today. So it's really talking about God's judgment. The fear of the Lord, the fear of God's judgment is clean. That's a good thing. You should fear God's judgment. His word and his judgment endure forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. That's all. Question 7. Let's reread verses 10 and 11. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is your servant warned, in keeping them there is great reward. So what is more desirable than gold? What are we talking about? God's Word. Nothing's changed. The context is the same. God's Word, God's precept, God's commands, God's witness. It's all the same. Because God's Word tells of His witness of Himself. God's Word tells of His creation. God's Word tells of His rules or His precepts, His commands. And they are desirable. Knowing God's will, knowing God's Word is to know God's will. And that is more desirable than gold, even fine gold. What are some benefits that that has? It's all in verse 11. I'll give you the hint. Reward. What's that? Reward. Yeah. By them, your servant is warned. So thanks to your word, Lord, I know what to do and what not to do. I'm warned. And then on top of that, in keeping your word, in doing so, I will have great reward. You might say, what kind of reward? Well, how about the very first and, and, and most special word, salvation? You, you need to know what God's word says, what God has said about how to be saved. And there's only one way. There's only the way, the truth, the life, who's Jesus Christ. So you, in keeping his word, in keeping his precepts about how to be saved, it's true. You get a great reward, as in salvation. And it doesn't stop there, of course. You're adopted into God's family. You get to live forever and ever with Him in heaven. No more pain, no more sorrow, no more tears, a new body. Oh. Blameless, upright, made into Christ-likeness, oh, in your righteousness. Oh. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. All right. What about uh, question 8? Let's read verses 12 and 13, and then we'll answer the question, what are they addressing? says, who can discern his errors? Declare me innocent from hidden faults. Keep back your servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless and innocent of great transgression. What, what is being said there? What's, what's this all addressing? David has talked about God's word. He's talked about how blessed it is that, that, and how blessed God is that creation glorifies him and that his word is glorifying him and it's it's well you'll be doing well if you abide by his word and now he says basically talks about discerning errors being declared innocent what's that sound like to you like like somebody who is being reminded about how great god is and how holy god is and then he looks inside and says oh, <laughs> i need forgiveness I need this judge whose word judges me to discern my error and declare me innocent. 
of the hidden faults, even the stuff that, that is not out in public. He's asking to be acquitted. Don't punish me. Forgive me. This is a request for forgiveness. This is the proper response. When you look at God's word and you say, God's word says this, I don't meet that. I'm sinning. I'm, I'm out of God's word in this part and in this part and in this part. This is the proper response. Save me, Lord. Quit me. Forgive me. Have mercy on me, a sinner. Keep me, keep me, keep back your servant means keep me from sin. Save me from sin. Save me from myself. That's what he's asking here. And he's saying that he will be blameless. He's got that confidence that if he beseeches the Lord to make him blameless and to forgive him and to show mercy and grace, that that is exactly what will happen. That God will deal with him graciously. Which is also according to his word. So David believes about God's judgment on sin. And he also believes about God's grace and mercy in dealing with sin when we say, God, please save me a sinner. Have mercy on me a sinner. This is something that as you mature in Christ, more and more you do. More and more you, you see all the sinfulness that you do. And it's not the same kind of sins that you did at the beginning. Now it's, you know, you're getting more and more laser focused, aren't you? Because you're not sinless, but you are sinning less and less and less. And so then you're coming to God as a maturing person and saying, God, I, you know, save me. I've, you've changed me. You've converted me. You've cleansed me. You've redeemed me. You're sanctifying me. And now by the work of your Holy Spirit within me, I'm seeing sin in myself that I never even noticed before. Equip me. Save me. Forgive me. Keep back your servant from sin. This is the proper response to God's word. So heavens declare God's glory. God declares his own glory through his word. And then our response to God's word is to compare what we are doing to it and then make what we need to do happen according to what God's word says. If I'm not living in God's word, then I repent. I ask for God to forgive me and I ask for him to keep me back from my sin. And when I am keeping God's word, well, then I know that I will be blessed. Any questions or thoughts on any of that? It's far better to be a person who does not deny your sinfulness, but admits it openly. I question the salvation of anybody who says that they are sinless currently. You're just not looking hard enough. Give me a couple minutes with you, I'll find one. <laughs> no. But we are. We are. I mean, let me just examine your thought life for a day. We'll find some sin there if nowhere else, right? What about what James says about the tongue? Those, the person who can bridle his tongue is a perfect man. Okay. Well, we know there's no such thing as a perfect man outside of Jesus Christ who is perfectly God and perfectly man. So let's look at your tongue. Huh? Let's find some sin there. That should be where we'll find it. Right? So it's far better to be the person who does not deny our sins but instead acknowledge them, you know, letting God do his work of sanctification in us. What? I said it doesn't take me long in the morning, especially like this <laughs> Okay, what, what special story are you going to tell about me this time? No. <laughs> I thought you were going to tell them about Lurleen and Cletus. No, just me yelling at you. Oh, okay. Yes. In the morning, she just gets up and starts singing songs about everything. I'm just like, stop. I like to sing songs in the morning about whatever it is I've seen or whatever I'm doing. Or I'll sing songs that make absolutely no sense whatsoever. It's just, just so distracting when I'm trying to get ready for work and I'm like, I have a limited amount of time. I'm like, okay, I got to work. Secretly, she loves my singing, but she pretends she doesn't. And secretly, she loves Cletus. So it's like, I'm Cletus and she's Lurleen. So in the morning, sometimes I'll do, Lord, 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 you know. And so, you know, yeah. And so, that's, that's our made up names that I made for us. Those are like our real names. Okay. So, yeah, so, you know. Then, then of course, you know, everything has to be. See, they all think it's dumb, too. <laughs> you gotta be there. You gotta be there. It's fun. It's just as fun as the stapler stuff, trust me. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, we, uh, steps You'll come around. You'll come around. <laughs> okay, please. <laughs> <laughs> well,
Uh, question 9. The sentiment in verse 14 is one of sacrifice. Verse 14 says, Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. This is, this is a sacrificial kind of statement. Okay, Knowing that, according to verse 14, what kind of sacrifice is acceptable to God? He says, Let the words of my mouth and the Meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. What does God want? What's an acceptable kind of sacrifice to God? Our words and our thoughts that are perfect. Yeah, our every day, right? Everything we do every day. My words, the meditation of my heart. God, I, I, I give that over to you. Keep your servant back from sin. Please guide my the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart. That's that's the core of who I am. What my heart, like, right, what, what, what comes out of the lips is the overflow of the heart, right? So that's the core of who I am. And so he's asking God, sacrificially, I want my words and the meditations of my heart to be yours, not mine. I, I give it over to you. I submit. I sacrifice. I, I just turn it all over to you. Do your work in me. And you know what happens when you pray that prayer? Lightning bolts come down and you instantly change that very second. You never have bad words or thoughts or intentions with the heart ever again. No, of course not, right? But God does his sanctifying work. He does answer that prayer. And he does work to complete the good work that he has begun in you. And that's a prayer that's definitely according to his will, 1 John 5.14. So he will hear and answer that prayer. But in the way that he answers it, in the timing that he answers it, or how long it takes to be completed, that's all up to his sovereign will. But he will do it. We want everything we think and everything we say to be acceptable to God. All of our life, all of everything that we do, think, say, we want it to be pleasing to God. Any thoughts about that? That's easy, right? Oh, yeah. That's something, if you did nothing else, if you efforted for that for the rest of your life, that would be enough to keep you busy. Like, Lord, I'm just going to focus on letting the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart being pleasing to you. I'm going to work on that. That's my goal for the rest of my life. You will never attain that goal this side of heaven. <laughs> so you'd be working at that the rest of your life. We all will. We all will. That's what God calls us to do. No thoughts on that? We can move to Psalm 20 then. Psalm 20, where we trust in the name of the Lord our God. Again, this is a psalm of David, so you know who's writing this. And David says in this short psalm, verse 1, May the Lord answer you in the day of trouble. May the name of the God of Jacob protect you. May he send you help from the sanctuary and give you support from Zion. May he remember all your offerings and regard with favor your burnt sacrifices. May he grant you your heart's desire. Oh, we love that one. May he grant you your heart's desire and fulfill all your plans. I can hear TBN rustling right now. May we shout for joy over your salvation and in the name of our God set up our banners. May the Lord fulfill all your petitions. Now I know that the Lord saves his anointed. He will answer him from his holy heaven with the saving might of his right hand. Some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. Great song. They collapse and fall, but in contrast, we rise and stand upright. O Lord, save the king. May he answer us when we call. Question 10. Can what is said and hoped for in the first two verses by David also be said and hoped for by believers today. It says, may the Lord answer you in the day of trouble. May the name of God, of the God of Jacob protect you. May he send you help from the sanctuary and give you support from Zion. What, uh, can what be said there be said today for believers? Why or why not? Yes, because they're just asking God for help. Yeah, this is a general asking for help. Now, contextually, because this is David talking about, we think that when you say day of trouble, you generally think war. This isn't talking about any kind of future day or anything like that, but 
this is most likely something that is war related, right? David being a, a warrior king. So may the Lord answer you in the day of trouble. May the Lord, um, may the Lord protect those who are his. God knows who are his. May God protect those who are his. May God go with those who are his. It's just a general concern. And yes, even though David's talking about this from his perspective and he's regarding it as a warrior king and he's talking about battle in most likelihood, the principle remains the same, that God goes with those who are his, that he will answer the call of those who put their faith and trust in him anytime, but also that time including days of trouble. Makes sense? This is, this is God saying that I'm going to take care of you. Uh, he says in the name of Jacob's God. This is a, a referring back to, hey, we're reminding you that we're your people. <laughs> we're reminding you that, that you set us apart for you, Lord, right? So in the same way, when you're thinking of God or praying to God, you can be like, God, remember how you said that you'd take care of your church, you'd always be with us and never forsake us, and that uh, you build the church and the gates of hell will never prevail against it. That's similar to what David's doing. Hey, hey, remember, you know, you were the people who are the, you're the God of Jacob, and, and we're the descendants of Jacob. Remember, we're, we're on your side. Come to our aid. Come out of your sanctuary. Come out of heaven to our aid. Make sense? He, God dwells, and he comes out from where you're dwelling, Lord. Do, protect us. No matter where you are, no matter where we are, protect us. Watch over us. That's all he's saying there. Question 11, what about verse 3? May he remember all your offerings and regard with favor your burnt sacrifices. Let's see, what's that mean? Is there, is there something deep being talked about here? Is this telling you that if you give God offerings and uh, if you go out right now and burn some sacrifices to God, that later, when you get to a, a troublesome spot, that you'll be able to pray to God and say, God, remember... When I burned that Yankee candle in your honor, God, remember, when regard me with favor with, for all these sacrifices that I've offered you, is that what this is saying? Or is it something a lot more basic than that? Got to remember what time this is written to. So when, you, when you're reading the Bible, you have historical context, too. This is David, the Old Testament. Okay? This isn't, this isn't New Testament. This is David, Old Testament knows about a coming Messiah who's promised, but doesn't know Jesus. So what do you think he's saying here? Remember all your burnt offerings. May God remember all your burnt offerings in regard with favor your burnt sacrifices. So if he's going to war and he's going out to battle, he's going to ching, ching, ching. That's what it sounds like when you go to battle. Ching, 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 right? Bat hitting swords against each other. Bang, bang, bang. And he's going out to war and he's asking God, please watch over us in the day of trouble. The war is coming. We're going to lead. I'm going to lead the people out to battle. Watch over us, protect us, and remember our burnt offerings. This was normal in the Old Testament to offer up burnt offerings not only for the forgiveness of sin, but also for, to, to praise God and glorify Him and ask for His help in battle. That was totally common. Totally common. We see a lot of that in 1 Samuel. It's normal. It's normal. That's all he's saying. He's saying, hey, remember all your offerings and regard with favor your burnt offerings. Just remember what we've done. We've glorified you. We acknowledge you as God. This isn't, this isn't him bartering. This isn't David saying, uh, hey, if you give me uh, glory in battle and you help us win, I'll throw some more of that sweet, sweet sheep up on the fire that you like so much. This isn't bartering. This is him saying, remember that we have done what you have said. You've asked us to offer sacrifices. We have done so. We have acknowledged you as God. We have worshipped you as creator. So that's all. This kind of ties into it in question 12, verse 4. Does it teach that God will grant all your personal desires and plans? Because verse 4 does say, May God grant you your heart's desire and fulfill all your plans. What do you think? Especially when you read it in context, right? If I was to, if we're reading this in context, so you know we're talking about battle, we know we're talking about this kind of day of trouble, right? And, 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 and the reliance upon God's people, on God, in days of trouble. If, if I tell you that that's the context, and then all of a sudden, out of left field, I say, now, 
in the midst of this context, let's talk about God's promises to give you anything you want. <laughs> You'd be like, what? It doesn't fit. That doesn't make sense. It's the same here. It doesn't make sense. This is not talking about God granting you or David or anybody your personal desires and plans. This is not talking about that. When it says, may he grant you your heart's desire to fulfill all your plans, what do you think it's really saying? Whose desires and whose plans? What's that? It's God's, right? The person who is genuinely seeking God and glorifying God and offering him the sacrifices that God asked for. God doesn't ask for burnt offerings anymore. God asks for the offering of everything you are. Your entire life, your words, your life, the meditations of your heart. You are now crucified with Christ. You deny yourself, pick up the cross, and follow him. That's the sacrifice God wants now. It, wasn't, it, it was different back in David's day. That was all foreshadowing what was going to happen when Christ came. And, and now for us, we are going by different rules here. So this has nothing to do, like you have to read Scripture historically, and you have to read Scripture in context. Like what's, talk, what's David writing about? Is David writing about how he really wishes that his yoga studio would get that bigger place down the road? You know, no, it has nothing to do with your personal plans or desires. Nothing to do with that whatsoever. Instead, what it's talking about is that if God wishes David to succeed or the king to succeed in battle, he shall. God establishes kings and he knocks them down. You want to see, you want to have all the, uh, God abandons those who do not, who abandon him. And God comes to the rescue of those who do not abandon him, who rely on him, who put their faith and trust in him. Such a person shall never be put to shame. Isaiah 26. So this isn't talking about your personal plans or desires. I think a lot of reasons, these two verses, so like Psalm 20, verse 4, and Psalm 37 get combined and smashed together to bring and get mistaught, to make you think that this is talking about your personal plans and desire. Here's Psalm 37, verses 3 and 4. It says, Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and enjoy safe pasture. Take delight in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Oh, wonderful. I can finally get that Tacoma Toyota 4x4 with the extended cap package. Because I will do good, I will take the light in the Lord, and He'll give me the desires of my heart. I desire a four by four, two tone extended cap package. Therefore, that's what I'm going to get, right? If I just believe enough and have enough faith. That that verse and th those verses, Psalm 37, three and four, and Psalm 20, verse four, are always pulled out of context. They're only they're, they're read alone or just together, but never with the scripture that's around them. Because if you were to read the scripture that's around him, you'd be like, wait a minute, this doesn't make sense. That has nothing to do with what else is being talked about here. And it's the Lord's will. And that's what, I think it was you, Joe, who had, who had said, it's, it's God's will. Yes, that's exactly right. He gives you your heart's desires, but it's not your heart's desires pre-God. It's your heart's desire post-God. So in other words, God promises that He'll fulfill your desires of your heart. But he never says that he's going to leave your desires as they are right this second. He, he, he changes you and changes your desires. And then he fulfills the desires of your heart when they have become his very own desires. God wins. God always gets his way. And so when he promises to fulfill the desires of your heart... He's not saying your personal desires and plans that you have for yourself. He's saying that I'm going to transform you and do such a work inside of you that your very desires and plans will change and become parallel to my own. And then I will fulfill them. Make sense? That's what he's talking about here. And in the context of war, he's saying that, that this is all about God's favor. Walk, walk according, abide in God's word and in his favor and and that means that you will be someone who's seeking God's will. And God will always come to the rescue of such a person. 
All right, question 13. Whose salvation is being rejoiced over in verse 5? It says, May we shout for joy over your salvation, and in the name of our God set up our banners. May the Lord fulfill all your petitions. Who is he, who is he talking about? May, may we shout for joy over your salvation. Remember the context. David's talking about a day of trouble, talking about war, talking about going to battle. And so now he's saying, May we shout for joy over your salvation. May we set up banners in the name of our God. When, when you think of battle, and you think of what happens after battle, if after battle you're talking about joy, salvation, and putting up banners, do you think he's talking about losing that battle, or do you think he's talking about victory? Victory. Victory, yes. Yes. It's victory. May we shout for joy over your salvation. Not just, this your salvation, you saved us from the day of trouble. This is foreshadowing. He saved us from the day of trouble in battle, but it's also foreshadowing the fact that God saves us from the day of trouble spiritually by his salvation. So he saves in those who he wishes to save in battle, on the day of trouble, physically speaking, and then of course he saves everybody that looks to him in faith on the day of trouble, spiritually speaking. And we all stand before the Lord. So we rejoice in his salvation. We shout for joy. In the name of our God, we set up banners. That's a sign of victory. You know, when the Browns lose, you don't run out and throw a Brown. Well, maybe the Browns lose it. But usually you don't run out and put a flag up when you lose. You put a flag out when you win. That's a sign of victory. That's the idea. God helped them to be victorious in battle. And if you were to take that and foreshadow that, God will help you be victorious in the battle for your very soul. And you rejoice in him for salvation in that sense. What about uh, the second part of that question 13? What does may the Lord fulfill all your petitions mean? May the Lord fulfill all your petitions. Your prayers? Prayers, yeah. Petitions and prayer. Sure. So what's it mean that he's saying, may the Lord fulfill all your petitions? This kind of goes back to our previous conversation, right, about Psalm 20, verse 4, or Psalm 37, verses 3 through 4. Is this saying that God's going to fulfill every single one of your prayers? I mean, no. I mean, the thing is, is that will God fulfill all your prayers? What's the only way God would fulfill all your prayers? If they're in line with his will, yes. So what this is really saying is, may the Lord fulfill your petitions, if you were to think of it like a mathematical equation. Think of it like this. May the Lord fulfill all your petitions, equal sign, may the Lord make your will his, or his will yours. That's what's being said. That's what's being said. You want to be successful in your prayer life, do it biblically. Look through the Bible and see, oh, pray for your, pray for your enemies, right? Pray for giving. Pray for, you want to know what to do, and you know God's word is, is where you're going to find it. Pray for wisdom, James 1, 5. The wisdom that you pray for is the wisdom in God's word, to find the wisdom in his word. Pray without ceasing. In other words, do it all the time. Let's be like breathing to you, Right? Psalm, uh, Philippians 4, verses 6 through 7. If you're fearful, afraid, anxiety ridden, full of worry, pray with supplication and thanksgiving. God, God will give you the peace that passes all understanding and guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. You pray with the right motivation because, like James 4 says, that you, know, you don't have because you are praying for the wrong things. Your prayers aren't answered because you're praying for the wrong things. What do you mean? I'm praying for exactly what it is I want. Da, 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 da. That's the problem. I'm praying for exactly what it is I want. That's the problem. God is not the cosmic gene. He's not at your service. We're at his service. So we must pray according to what it is he wants. And that's the trick. That's the goal. That's why it's good to say, may the Lord answer all your petitions, because it's a, a roundabout way or a fancy way of saying, may God make it so that everything you ask of him is according to his will. What a great prayer. What a great prayer. Question 14. 
Who is the anointed mentioned in verse 6? Now I know that the Lord saves his anointed. He will answer him from his holy heaven with the saving might of his, of his right hand. So there's lots of different anointeds, so you must look at it contextually here to verse 6. Who do you think he's talking about? This is another name. I'll give you a hint. It's talking about one person in particular, and it's the same person who wrote the song. David. David. Pretty good. He's just a little hint. I know, it's a tricky one. It's just another name for the king. God anointed David to be king over Israel. He's just saying, now I know that the Lord saves his anointed. What just happened in Psalm 20? God, David prayed to God to save him in the day of trouble. He's going to battle. And then he wins the battle. Thanks to God. He, rejoice, joy, salvation, banners of victory. Thank you, Lord. And then what does he say right after this victory? He says, now I know that the Lord saves his anointed. This isn't hard. It, it's clear when we slow down and just like, see? He's, now I know the Lord saves his anointed, the king, me. Now I know that God saves me. Yeah, because it just happened. That's why he's saying that. The Lord just saved his anointed. He will answer him from his holy heaven with the saving might of his right hand. God will save those who run to him and oppose those who oppose him. Anytime you hear the mention of God's right hand, it's a mention of God's protection or blessing right hand of God. You hear that anywhere. It's regarding protection and blessing. And that's what David's saying here. And what is the anointed assured of, according to verse 6? Now I know that the Lord, what? Saves his anointed, and that he will answer his anointed from the holy heaven, and save them by the might of his right hand. Now, contextually, this is talking about David. But if you were to take this as a principle, you can apply this to every person that God anoints. And anointing, basically, for a believer is everyone. Because every believer is anointed or indwelt by God's Holy Spirit. So every believer is anointed. Every person who's put their faith in God is anointed. So now, principally, you can read it that way and say, Now I know that the Lord saves those who he indwells. Those that he gave faith to, he'll save. And he'll answer them from his holy heaven and save them by the might of his right hand. So even though contextually it's talking about David, you have a principle there that stands true in all of Scripture. You won't find a, a Scripture that goes against this. You won't find a Scripture that says, well, God saves his uh, anointed except for this one or that one. No, God always saves his anointed. Every one of his anointed will be saved on the day of, on the day of wrath from from God's wrath because of the salvation that God has given us as a free gift through His grace and through faith in Christ. So, yeah, the Lord saves His anointed, doesn't He? Yes. Both here in David's terms, but also foreshadowing again, saving the anointed, spiritually speaking, those who God saves. He saves us. He provides for us. When we have a day of trouble and we cry out to Him, you know that you can trust that God will do what is best. I don't know what that means in certain circumstances. Every circumstance is different. might be best for me to lose this game, or for me to have this business fail, or for me to have this. God might not be looking long term, whereas I can only see what's in front of me. But I can trust that God is good, and that the Romans 8.28 principle is in effect. That everything that happens is for the good of those who love him and who are called according to his purpose. Well, question 15. Verses 7 and 8. Some trust in chariots, and some in horses. But we trust in the name of the Lord our God. They collapse and fall, but we rise and stand upright. What does that mean? Let's take verse 7 for What does that mean? Some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. Think of it again in context. What just happened? There was a ching, 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 a battle. Maybe rock and sock and robots would be better. So there's a battle, right? And there was, there was two sides in this battle, right? There's these guys and there's these guys. And they, ching, 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 right? They're battling. And one group, one group put their trust in what? In... Well, that's not a chariot, that's a horse, but yes. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I didn't do the chariot. 
Ben Hur, you know. So, so once one side trusted in their military might, they trusted in their horses, they trusted in their chariots, they trusted in what they had, their own strength. But there was the other side. What did the other side trust in? God. And and they trusted in the name of the Lord our God. That's what they mean by that. That we trusted in God. They trusted in their military might, but we trusted in God. And who won? Those who trusted in God. And so now, what about verse 8? They collapse and fall, but we rise and stand up. Right? See how it makes sense now? This is just David giving the contrast. They trusted in their military might and their own strength and in their own wisdom and in their horses and their chariots. They trusted in all this stuff that was of themselves, and they fell. We trusted in God, in the name of the Lord our God, and we stand upright. We didn't fall. We didn't die. We won. We were victorious. You can obviously see the parallels and the contrast there. It goes for spiritual reality for us today. Trust in yourself and die. Fall. Trust in God and in the name of the Lord and stand upright. Live. It's just a consistent drumbeat through Scripture. Stand against God. Fall. Stand with God. Live. Find grace. Find mercy. What about question 16? What does David mean in verse 9 when he says, O Lord, save the king. May he answer us when we call. This is, imagine, if I keep the context in mind about David was going into battle, had a great battle, won the battle thanks to God, and this is a capper, right? This is the ending verse of the, of the psalm. So what, what do you think he means when he says, Oh Lord, save the king. May he answer us when we call. You think he's just recapping? Not heads up, no. He's recapping. That's all he's doing. The Lord said, uh, grant victory to me. Grant victory to us who trust in you. In other words, you did it again. Now do it the next time too. You've done it in the past. You just did it now in the present. Now do it again in the future if the need ever arises. And may you answer us when we call again in the future just like you did now in the present and just like you've done before in the past. That's a great way of capping that off, isn't it? Now you guys have to Very good. Very good. Thoughts? Questions? That's it. That's all she wrote. That's it for Psalm 20. How about, shall we pray to you? Father, we thank you for your mighty hand, that you are the victorious warrior and creator that none can stand against you, and that those who take refuge in the shadow of your wing are always kept safe. And Lord, it, we need to hear that now more than ever. And remind us of all the promises that, that you fulfill, and that we don't have to worry about them. If We don't have to have any ifs. We can have full assurance and hope that we know will be realized, because you're the one who, who makes sure all the promises of your word are yes and amen. And so we thank you for all these things, Lord, and ask that you would remind us whenever we're afraid that we can fear no more because you forever reign on the throne and that will never change. We thank you for that and for all these things too in Jesus' name.